Hello, my name is Kat. My name is Mia. And my name is Mackenzie. And welcome to the, the Couch, Couch Potato, Potato Lab. Lab, the show where we bring the science to you. To my left. Hi, my name is Mia. My pronouns are she, her. And a fun fact about me is I have been to 19 countries in my life. Holy. 19. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Wow. And my name is Kat. My pronouns are she, her. And a fun fact about me is I PR'd my hang block clean this morning at the gym at 198 pounds. So I was very excited about that. Wanted to get 200, but just wasn't happening today. Uh, tomorrow, Kat. You'll oh, get it tomorrow. Thanks, Kenzie. All right, let's meet to my right. Hello, everyone. My name is Mackenzie. My pronouns are she, her. And a fun fact about me, um... To be honest, my tummy hurts a little bit, and I think it's because I had a snack before the show, and I thought it was going to be really yummy. I made it in my kitchen last night, but turned out, I think I accidentally ate some of the Play-Doh. <gasps> so hopefully my stomach starts feeling better soon, but you know what? I think all of the fun is just going to, you know, distract me anyways. But before we get started, I just want to recognize that we are coming live to you from Treaty 4 territory. So that is home of the Nehewak, Nakawe, Lakota, Lakota, Nakota, as well as the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. We ex invite you to recognize where you are today because we recognize that our audience is diverse and comes from all over. So we t invite you to take a minute to recognize where you are today and where you're going to be learning with us. Great. Thank you, Mackenzie. Now, scientists, I'm going to ask you to step out in front of your tables because I want to make sure that your brains are warmed up for today's episodes. All right, are you ready? I'm yes. ready. All right, so first I need to see five jumping jacks. Let's right. go. One, two, two, three, four, five. All right, now I want you to do, uh, pretend you're jump roped. Let's do some jump rope. Okay. Hop on the place. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Oh, goodness. This feels like a workout. <laughs> Keep going. All right. Now do some squats. Okay. Perfect. Great form. Nice and tight. Oh, good yeah. job. All right. Now let's do some lunges. Forward lunges. lunges. Okay. This is like a gym workout. Yeah, geez. <laughs> I already went to the gym today. All that's right. Okay. Perfect. Do you feel it like your brains are warmed up? Yeah. Yeah, do you? It does. My brain does feel really yeah. warm. Perfect. Now, Kat, I don't know. I think some people might be confused because it did kind of feel like a workout. Like, I'm kind of out of breath right now. Yeah. So definitely felt like a workout. But the thing is, is that while we were doing that, we were also warming up our brain. Because our brain told us what to do. It told us that we... It told us, took what Kat told us to do, and then we did it as an action. And that had to do with everything happening in our nervous system. Wow. Really? It did, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> to kind of explain this nervous system, and m as Mackenzie said, you took the information I said, your brain, it got to your brain somehow and told you what to do. We have a uh, little experiment we would like to do. Now, Mia, would you start this experiment for us? Yes. So, I have this pot here, and we're going to pretend that this has boiling hot water in it. So, the first step is I am going to be the stimuli. So, it is hot water. So, now, my, now I have to think, am I going to touch this hot water? Is that a good idea? So, I have to bring it over to Kat. All right, so we had this stimuli it being the hot water, and as Mia places her hand over it, her sensory neurons can tell that, hey, this water is hot. So right now, just her sensory neurons can feel that the water is hot. There's like maybe some steam coming off of it that they can feel. So now we need to pass this message along to the brain. Mackenzie? All right. So then the sensory neuron sends that information up to the brain. Now once it gets to the brain, this sensory neuron it has a lot of information in it and the brain reads this information. And the, the brain gets to kind of determine what it thinks about it. So it's combining all of the information we know in our different memories and our experiences from the past so that we can take this information that our senses are taking and to kind of interpret it to decide what we should do next. So in this case, the brain is saying, ouch, if we touch that hot water, it's going to burn us and it's going to hurt. 
So the brain decides that we should move our hand so we can avoid that. Now, we can't just leave that information in the brain, otherwise it's going to sit there and it's not going to do anything. So I'm actually going to send it back down that pathway and I'm going to send it over to cat. So now that the brain has decided that we want to move our hand away from this water, we need to send that message through our motor neurons because our motor neurons will send the message to our hand to get it to move. So and we need to pass this message along back to Mia. All right, so now we, I'm going to do the action. So the action is to move my hand because it is too hot. So then I know, okay, I have to move my hand and I'm not going to touch the hot water. So this has to do with two different um, words, so afferent and efferent. So the afferent pathway is going to the brain and then the efferent pa pathway is coming back from the brain and then doing the action. Okay, so as you said, so the afferent takes that message in, kind of like how you pass that message to me being the sensory neurons and it passed it to the brain being Mackenzie and then the efferent pathway was coming back that way, right? The yes. motor neurons? Okay. Yeah, so it all works in a pathway, and this pathway has a lot of different parts, which is why Mia, Kat, and I all had a different function. So Mia was the senses. That stimuli is picked up by the senses. So we have our five senses. So we have smell, taste, touch, hearing, and taste. 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 We have our five senses, and they pick up that stimuli information. Our sensory neurons send it up to the brain. So that's our afferent um, neurons taking it to the brain, and then from there it takes through our motor neurons, so our motor neurons are taking it the information in an action, and then it is an action when we um, that we can observe at the end, so that's our response. So it's kind of like a cause and effect um, movement for all of these different pathways, and we're going to go through them today because it all has to do with our nervous system. Now, let's break this nervous system down into its parts. So we have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. Now, central nervous system. We want to think, what's at the center of us? That is our brain and spinal cord. But our peripheral nervous system, that means kind of away from the center. And so our peripheral nervous system is made up of all the nerves that branch off from that spinal cord. Now, Kenzie and Mia, do we have any kind of way to visualize this central nervous system? Yes, of course. So we're going to start in that central nervous system, and that is our spinal cord and our brain. Now, they kind of both have different functions. They're both very important, but we're going to start off with that spinal cord. So our spinal cord is a really thin, long, tubular structure, and it goes all the way from our lower back up to our skull. Now our actual spinal cord, it's really, really fragile. So there's um, a whole structure around it called the spinal column that keeps it safe and protects it because we don't want it to get damaged because if it gets damaged, lots of different things can happen that aren't really great for us and they can cause us to not get the right information to different places and they can also affect our movement through those motor neurons. So we're actually going to um, build our own spinal columns today and as we're building it we're going to learn about all the different parts and why they're there and why they're important. Do you think we can do that Kat? I think we can and that bowl of candy certainly looks delicious. Am, uh, am I going to get a snack later? <laughs> well Kat you're on the right track. So we're going to pull out our candy. You can follow along all of the materials and information that you're going to need is in that lab manual as well so you can follow along on that and we're going to make it together. So first, let's start with our Twizzlers. Now, um, Mia and I, we have these pull-apart ones. So we're actually just going to pull apart one of these because this whole licorice is pretty thick. And I mentioned how that spinal cord is really thin and long. So I'm just going to take one of them so that we can make sure that we're really representing it um, to be really thin and fragile. So we have to be careful with this as well because if we like pull on it or anything like that, it's going to break. Kind of similar to our spinal cord. So we have to be very, very careful with this little piece. Now we're going to have a couple of different components to protect our spinal cord. So I have some hard um, candies. They're lifesavers. They're really hard. So nice and hard. And then I also have some soft ones. So these ones are gummy ones. You can um, bend them. And they're going to act like the different parts of our spinal column. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the hard ones to represent our vertebrae. And we have um, vertebrae in our spinal column too. And then these, the gummy ones, are going to use our intervertebrae. And we're going to stack them um, alternating. So we're going to put a hard one, a soft one, a hard one, and a soft one. And the soft ones allow us to have a little bit of movement so that we can, you know, bend over and things like that. Um, but it also, they all, the whole, the whole point of all of them stacking up together is that it's protecting this spinal cord. So me and I are, we're going to go ahead and put our lifesavers on there. So we're going to alternate between a hard and a gummy. And I'm just going to do that all the way up because it's really long, this spinal column. So I'm just going to. Now, uh, Mia, Mackenzie, I have a very fun fact for you. Do you know why you are actually taller in the morning? Did mm -hmm. you know you're taller in the morning? That, that I didn't know that. Yeah. So just like those jellies that you're building, th um, them being your inter intervertebrates where um, there's fluid between those bone structures in your spinal column, those kind of shrink a little bit throughout the day as we're standing and um, the bones push down on each other. So you're actually a little bit taller in the morning if you wanted to measure yourself compared to right before bed. Huh. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So I'm just going to continue um, adding them on here. I want to make sure that this is really nice and big. So again, we're alternating between the two. It's looking really colorful, which is nice to see. Nice and nice and bright. All right. You know what? I think that that's pretty good, what I have here. How's yours coming along, Mia? Mine looks really colorful and good. I think, is yours this long, Kenzie? Like, is that good? Yeah, I think that we're, I think we're off to a good start here. Okay. Your spinal so I'm column is... Nice and protected, or your spinal cord is protected, yes. right? Yes. So yes, all together, this is our spinal column. So we have our spinal cord that's holding it in the inside, and then we have our alternating um, hard candies and soft candies. So as you can see, if we just had, I'm just going to show you with these hard candies. If we just stacked a bunch of these hard candies on top of each other, doesn't matter what I do, you can't move them. They're just stuck. So what? It's really important that we have those intervertebrae in between because as you can see, now I can move it. It kind of tilts and it moves. So that's oh. going to allow us to bend over and things like that so that we're not just constantly standing upright. Now, this is just our spinal column. And this is where a lot of those, that, those um, information from our sensory neurons and our motor neurons is traveling through. But not all of our um, information is going to come from the very bottom or the very top. And that's because there's actually neurons and nerves that extend all over from outside of this. So that's what we're going to do next. So we're going to peel off um, another one of these licorices, a couple of them. And we're going to, yeah, just put them in little pieces. Like, that's perfect. So I'm going to peel off a couple of them so I have lots ready. And then what we're going to do with these is just randomly, wherever you want, we're going to just kind of thread them through and tie them between our lifesavers, kind of like this. Whoopsie. And what do these like represent, this. Kenzie? Yes, yeah, so these are our nerves. Our nerves. Okay. Our nerves that are coming and extending out. So I'm actually going to make them a little bit longer. Those were a little bit too short. And so this is the start of our peripheral nervous system. Yes, that's right. Because we're going to want to take all of the um, information from all over our body th that we're getting through our senses. And um, some of it's coming from not the very bottom of our spinal column or the very top of it. So these nerves are also bringing in those messages. So if you can see here, some of these nerves are going to be bringing in information. So information like what we're hearing, what we're touching, what we're feeling. And then some of the nerves are actually bringing information out. So some of them are going to be motor neurons and some of them are going to be sensory neurons, depending on what their function is and it, but depending on if they're bringing information to our brain or from our brain. So you can just continue to add as many as you want. We just want it to look like they're sticking out kind of like that. 
And these nerves, they travel and touch every single part of our body. And scientists have actually created a map to figure out which nerves touch these parts of our body. So we do have a graphic that we would like to show you. And this graphic is a dermatomes map. Now, this shows which specific nerves coming out of that spinal column touch which part of our body. So they control um, if we, which part of the body we function, what we can feel. And you can see that some parts of our body, like our hand, actually has three different nerves that touch it and connect it. So you can see that the hand actually receives uh, signals from nerves from the C6 nerve, the C7 nerve, and the C8 nerve. So that means if, say, you damaged your C6 nerve that controls your thumb, you would still be able to uh, control the other four fingers of your hand. And this dermatome map is really important in the medical field because sometimes people get medicine put into that spinal cord. Maybe you've heard the term spinal or epidural. Sometimes people get it when they get a surgery or um, if they're giving birth and having a baby, sometimes they get special medicine put into the spaces in that spinal cord to help numb um, the pain that would be happening below there. And so it's really important that uh, I know in nursing, I've had to know about dermatomes because you need to uh, know when uh, the person has that feeling come back into maybe their legs and at what point that feeling goes up to because um, in that dermatome map, if we could bring it up back up one more time, you can see that in the map, um, the T4, right there, that's at the nipple line. So we want to make sure that the numbing or that not being able to feel anything doesn't go up to T4 because your diaphragm is there. And your diaphragm is this big sheet of muscle that helps you breathe. And so if that numbing medicine got all the way up there, you wouldn't be able to breathe anymore. So it's very important that we know which nerves um, help control each part of our body. Now, Kenzie, Mia, how are these spinal columns looking? Well, it's looking really good. And the one thing I just want to say is that the reason it is so, so important that we're protecting this spinal cord is because, you know, unlike sometimes if we hurt our foot or maybe we get a little cut in our, in our hand or something, we can usually, like, recover from that. It will repair and it, it might be okay. You might need to get, like, a little bit of rest or something, but it usually can fix itself. Whereas the spinal cord, if you damage it, a lot of times that damage is permanent. So you can't reverse it. So it's really important that we're protecting it because once it's, once it's damaged, it's usually damaged forever or for a really long time. So if you damage it, you'll... Um, you can sometimes lose um, the different sensations and like the ability to send information up your spinal cord. And you can also sometimes lose your different um, um, movement and muscle memory and things like that. So sometimes if you get paralyzed, um, if your spinal cord gets damaged, you won't be able to walk or maybe you won't be able to move your, your legs or your arms depending on where you were damaged. So if you were damaged down here, you might be able to move from here up. But if you get damaged way up here, then you might have a hard time even moving your arms. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really important that we're very careful with things in our back, in our spinal cord, and that um, we're making sure we have all of our vertebrae and intervertebrae in check at all times. Yeah. And that's where the terms, uh, you may have heard paraplegic or quadriplegic come from. So paraplegic means that you don't have control um, from of your leg. So it can be like waist down. And then quadriplegic means that you won't have any control of your arms or legs. Now, we have a wonderful question here from the Hayes brothers. How many brain cells do we have in our brains? Mia, do you know? Yes. So... There are about 100 billion brain cells in the brain, and they are all connected to synapses in the brain as well. And each brain cell is can be connected to another tens of thousands of other brain cells. Oh my goodness, that many cells? Yes. Billion? Yeah. 100 billion, all in my brain. <laughs> Wow, maybe that's why it, it's so hard sometimes to remember what I had for breakfast. That is a lot of cells, <laughs> and they all work together, and they help us um, make decisions in our day-to-day -day life and bring everything around us in our environment and turn it into responses. So all day long, we're having cause and effect um, reactions, and that has all to do with our nervous system and the stimuli around us.
Okay, so we have broken down the uh, central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and the Hates brothers just asked a question about our brain cells. Now, Mia, are the brain cells, are they the same as like the cells in my, my hands or in my heart? No, they are not. These cells are specific to different neurons um, in our brain. So this is what it would look like. So it looks different than, I guess, like other cells that we might have looked at in the past. Oh, okay. um, but talking about this, so this right here, this is an axon. So it's a very tall, or not tall, but a long <laughs> tail-like structure. And this connects to our neuron cell body, which is this. Um, and then on our neuron cell body, we have things called dendrites. And these dendrites are what allows other cells to communicate with um, this neuron cell and give them information about what to do. And that goes through our axon, which is this long thing right here. And this is covered in a fatty-like substance, which is called the myelin sheath. And so the myelin sheath um, allows the... Um, it allows the electrical signal to go through to this axon terminal. And in the axon terminal, this is where um, it can, can connect to other cells. And so the axon is the primary transmission line um, of the nervous system. Okay, so that is our nervous system cells. Yes. So those are what the cells in my brain look like? Yes. Okay. Now. Mackenzie, are these cells working all the time? Do they ever get to take a break? I mean, I feel like I'm doing stuff all the time. That's a great question, Kat. And the answer is actually no. And there's the thing is that they always have the potential to be firing and to be working, but they're not always working really hard. And when I think of axons and their potential, I like to think of a sugar rush. So I actually brought a bowl of candy. Well, I have a lot of candy here and I'm very excited to eat this and I'm going to use this to kind of explain what's happening with those axons and their different potential. So this is a bowl full of candy. Now, if my mom was here, she'd probably tell me I could have one or two, <laughs> but she's not here. So I'm going to go ahead and eat this entire <gasps> bowl of candy. All of it? All of it. Really? Mia, will yeah. you will you do it with me too? Yes, I'm going to do this with you. I'm going to eat all of this candy right here. So <laughs> the reason my mom would probably tell me I can't have this entire bowl of candy is because there is a lot of sugar in here. All of these candies have so much sugar. I'm not sure if you can tell, but they're actually coated in sugar wow. as well. And in here, there's a lot of energy because sugar um, it is a fast carb. So it gives you really, really fast energy. And that's what we call a sugar rush sometimes. So maybe if you're drinking a lot of pop or you had a lot of cake or candy, you might get a sugar rush and feel like you have so much energy that you just want to run around. So I'm going to I'm going to eat as much as I can and then we're going to see what happens. <laughs> All right. So we'll let Kenzie and Mia chow down on their candy. I guess I have none. Um, but as Mackenzie was saying, sometimes, you know, um, like candy is really great because it gives you a really quick rush of sugar. Uh, you might know someone maybe who has diabetes and in diabetes it's really important that if they have diabetes that they have access to something that will also give them a quick rush of sugar because they have to check their blood sugar levels and if their blood sugar levels are really really low they need something to spike them back up really quick and sometimes they need a food that's going to help maintain that too. All right. Kenzie, M Mia, are, are you've eaten your candy? No, no. no? You count us down. <laughs> I, was, oh, I was waiting oh, for okay. you to tell me when. Okay. Are we okay. ready? You yeah. need yeah. 10 seconds? I need more than that. I need yeah. like 20 or 30 <laughs> seconds. This is a lot of candy, cat. All right. Let's count them down. Um, can we do it in French? Do we remember French? I remember you French. You tell me. You tell we'll me. Let's try. All right. I'll count up because I don't know if I can count down <laughs> from French <laughs> that well. Okay. okay. Ready? Un, deux, trois, cat. Saint, six, set, week, neuf, dix, onze, douze, treize, quatorze, quinze, seize, dix-sept, dix-huit, dix-neuf, vingt. Are you done? <laughs> Time's up. <laughs> That's a lot of candy to eat in a very short period of time. Do you feel yeah. the sugar rush yet? I'm feeling it. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't finish, for sure. All right. Um, 
I can count to ten in Spanish, I think, maybe. Uno, <laughs> dos, tres, cuatro. I can't remember what five is. Cinco! Is it? Cinco. <laughs> Says siete. Seis, siete, ocho, nueve, nueve diez. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ken I can't. <laughs> Kenzie's done. Mia was helping me with my Spanish. I can't <laughs> finish. That's way too much sugar for me. <laughs> Whoa, Mackenzie. Are are I think you you might be having a sugar rush. Look at you. Yeah, I have I have so much energy. You have so much Well, what are you going to do with this energy? I could run a marathon. Jumping jacks? With jumping jacks? More jumping jacks. More j are you are you ready? Yeah. Okay. We have a huge sugar rush. We need to do something with yeah. this energy. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Step out again. We'll go through Big got a boot camp. Okay, okay ready? Yeah. Uh five jumping jacks. Okay, okay, five <laughs> squats. <laughs> Jumping lunges. Jumping lunges. <laughs> <laughs> all right, do you still have energy after all of that? That was so <gasps> fast. Oh, oh my god. god. Okay, I'm I tired. Okay. I'm so tired. Yeah, you had a lot of energy that you had to use up right there. Yeah. I think I used it all. all like of I it? don't even know if I have any left. Yeah. I think it's gone. I think my rush is over. It was that fast? It was that fast. Oh my goodness. And you know what? I'm actually gonna graph this because I love math so much. So let's bring this here. I'll catch my breath. I think oh. I need to do more jumping jacks because that's really getting me out of breath. Oh. Okay. So we were talking about um, axons and their action potential. So that sugar rush, you could see we had, before I had all the sugar, I was kind of just, you know, normal, living my normal life. I had that sugar and I spiked up so much. And then I just had a really fast fall because I used all of that energy up. And I think slowly, I think I'm starting to get back to normal. I feel pretty good now. Mm -hmm. And I think normally it wouldn't really happen that fast, but everything, crazy things happen on the couch potato lab, so. All right. So this is called an action potential. So this is kind of what the graph would look like. So if we had, this is my rest, and then I spiked up, down, and back up. So this is kind of what's happening with that action potential. So right here, this line right here, that's kind of my rest. So this is what it looks like at rest. And then you'll notice that if we go right across, this is also rest. So that was before the sugar rush candy, right? That's right. Okay. So right before the sugar rush candy and right after. So that's where the energy level is when we are just resting, just normal. Now an axon, when it fires, so when it gets a message that it needs to maybe transmit or move somewhere, it goes up. So this is when it goes all the way up, so this little part right here, before it moves on, this is the stimuli. So if we remember back to when Mia was the hot water, this would be that hot water. And this is when there is something that needs reacted to or a message sent. So then it fires up. This is the very tip of it. And so maybe that's when they receive the message or the action happens, and then it goes down. Now you'll notice that it goes a little bit even farther down than the resting point. And that's just when it's going to go all the way down. And then I like to think of this as like recharging. So that's kind of when it's going to recharge. Mm -hmm. Like the cell needs to recharge? Yeah. Oh, okay. From and working so hard to yes. send that message. Okay. Yes. And then eventually it get back gets back up to rest and it's ready to start it all again. So that's when um, our, our axons and neurons are firing. And that's when Kat asked if they're always working. They're not really always working, but they're always ready. They're always just at rest, waiting for this point here when they get that stimuli. And that's when they're going to act fast. And now this happens so, so fast, we don't even notice it. It happens just like that. So that's why you can easily see the stimuli. So you see that hot water, and you know right away not to touch it. Because it's happening so fast that by the time it gets up, up there to our brain and down, we've already moved because it just happens so, so fast. And it's really important that it's that fast because it keeps us safe and it makes sure that we don't have all of these little 
resting periods in between where we don't know what to do with our different actions and things like that. So we can respond really fast to the stimuli and all the things around us. Wow, very cool. Now folks, just a reminder, if you would like to text in any of your questions to the show, you can do that at 306 five seven zero one zero one three and you can also reach out to us on our social media at eyes youth all right scientists so we've covered axons we've covered the the peripheral nervous system we've covered part of the central nervous system but i remember saying that central nervous system has the spinal cord and the brain can we learn more about the brain when you say yeah. Yeah? Okay, Mia, could you start us off? Yes. So, on the brain, there are four main lobes, and we have a graphic that will show the four main lobes. Um, and yeah, so you can see the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And they each, each lobe um, does a different thing for your body or for something that you will do. So, we're going to start with the frontal lobe. So, the frontal lobe is the biggest lobe, and I'm gonna use this Play-Doh to show our different lobes. So I'm gonna make this one pretty big, and this one is right um, behind your forehead. So it's like right in the front, right there. And this one does a lot of different things. This helps with planning, it helps with speech, it helps with movement, emotions, and problem solving. So the main things that it does is it helps you to think logically, and it also helps regulate your emotions. So that one is going to be right at the front. I'll put it here. Now, Mia, I actually have a cool experiment showing how the frontal lobe works to help regulate our emotions. Are yeah. you, will you try it out for me? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I have a straw on your table there. Now, yeah. I want you to put that straw in your mouth like you're smiling. Yes, okay, now I'm going to tell you the most funny joke you've ever heard, okay? <laughs> Ready? What has six legs and no eyes? What? A snake. <laughs> so, so funny. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> All right, now I want you to put that straw in your mouth, kind of like you're going to frown, like, mm, yeah, yeah, just like that. Perfect. All right, now I'm going to tell you another joke, okay? What do you call a pickle wearing a bandana? What? Larry. <laughs> that one was... So what? funny, but uh, not as funny. So, was the first joke funnier than the second? Yes. Now, s that experience ki kind of shows how Mia was smiling for that first joke, right? So that's telling her brain already. What do we do when we when we're smiling? We're happy. That's how we're feeling. We're laughing. We're excited. And so when I told her that joke, it felt funnier, even though it maybe wasn't my my finest work of <laughs> jokes but because she was already smiling it felt funnier compared to the second joke which even though it was equally not as my finest i would say but she was frowning already so it felt like it wasn't that great in the first place yeah when you said larry it made me like kind of sad just because i was frowning <laughs> oh no <laughs> now that was the frontal lobe mackenzie can you take us on over to the next lobe Yes, I can. So if we look at that graphic again, we're going to look at another lobe now. So this graphic, we're going to look at the parietal lobe. So that one's the yellow one there on your screen. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to add this to our Play-Doh diagram of our brain. So we have the frontal lobe at the front. And now we saw that the, that parietal uh, lobe was right on the top of our head. And it is a little bit smaller than our frontal lobe. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stick it up at the front. Now it's going to it's going to have to like lay on its side for now, but we'll add something to the bottom there, but it's just right there at the top. So this is the front of our head and this is the very top. Now the parietal lobe, it's kind of deals with um, different senses like temperature, pressure, pain, um, all those types of senses that kind of have to do with touch. So we have um, the two lobes on top there. And now, Kat, do you have something else that we can use to try to test this one out? Well, we did do that activity earlier, right, Ab about uh, Mia having the hot water. And Mia uh, put her hand out, and she could feel that the water was hot. And so her parietal lobe was working there to say, whoa, 
I think this temperature is hot. And if I get any closer, I'm going to be in pain. Ah, uh, yeah. So actually, I have something really similar here. So I have two um, buckets of water here, and they're actually at different temperatures. So I'm going to put my hand in. We're going to see how long I can keep my hand in there. And then I'm going to see if you can, I'll kind of give a rating on my expression, and then we'll try to see which one was hot and which one was cold based on my comfort level inside it. Okay. okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually not sure which one is which, so we'll just start with this one here. I'm going to put my hand in, and then we're going to count how long I can keep my hand in it. Okay. One, Whew. two, three, four, five, <laughs> six. Six. Okay, oh. uh, six. Yeah, so that one, I would say that's a three. I would... If it was really hot out, then I might give it a higher rating. That's the only hint I'm giving you. <gasps> okay. 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 Now I'm gonna put I'm gonna put my hand in this one and see how long I can keep it in there, okay? Okay. Okay. One, one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Honestly, like you, you I could think camp out there all day. Yeah, so like <laughs> I think that I would, I'd stay in there for like an hour. I love to have baths, and honestly, I would bath in that one. So mm. I'm gonna give that one like a nine. Wow. Okay. So based on those ratings and how long I could keep it in there, which one do you think was cold, and which one do you think was like room temperature or warm? Okay, Mia, wh what do we think? I think that the room temperature one was the one that you kept your hand in longer for. Yes, yeah. you're right. So what was happening there is I put my hand in. And then it went up to my parietal lobe, that sensory information. So it traveled through my hand, through those senses, up through the sensory neurons, went to the parietal lobe, and then my that lobe was kind of deciding what the temperature was like and if I liked it or didn't like it. So I like to think of the brain as being really, really organized. They have all of these little file folders. So it knows exactly where to send that information up. So it's not like it's getting there and deciding. It knows exactly where that information needs to go so that we can get a response right away. So, so far we have that frontal lobe and then we have that parietal lobe mm -hmm. as well. But we're not quite done yet, right? Yeah. Right. All right, Mia, take us on over to the temporal lobe. Yes. So, if we look at the graphic again, we will see that the temporal lobe is the green one. And this is attached to all the other lobes. Um, and it is right by our ears. So, this um, lobe helps us regulate our ability to hear so it helps us hear and it also helps with our memory so it helps us remember things so we're going to put that one right underneath there and um, there is a activity in the lab manual where you can remember a list of things and then wait five minutes and then later on try it again and see if you can still remember that list um, and you can try that after this episode if you would like. Amazing. All right. So we do have another question here from Theo. Hello Theo. Thank you for your question. Can quadriplegics learn to walk again? Mackenzie? Uh, yes, of course. I, I got this question. So yeah, unlike other things in our body, the spinal cord, the damage is usually pretty permanent. So there is some promising research going on. There's lots of different information and people are trying different things. But as of right now, um, there's no definite answer. They, they, ha they can't guarantee that you're going to be able to walk again. So that's why it's just extra, care, um, extra important that we're careful with that spinal cord because the damage um, is irreversible. Yeah. All right, Mackenzie, and I believe there is one last lobe in that brain, and that is the occipital lobe. Can you take us there? Yes, of course. So um, if we look at this graphic again, we're going to get to that very last lobe. So that's that little tiny one on the very back of our head. So we're going to add that to our brain diagram here. So I'm going to use this orange, and I'm just going to put it so I have my frontal, the parietal, this is our temporal, and I'm just going to add it to the very back there. And then together, this is our brain. So now, 
This is called the occipital lobe, and that primarily has to do with our vision, so how we perceive things, what we're looking at, and also the different colors and stimuli that we can see through our vision. So there's actually another activity that you can do in the activity guide, in the lab manual, and it has to do with looking at um, two different images and their colors. And it's you, if you look at one and then you look at the other one, you're going to see what happens in our with the vision. I don't want to give it away, so I'm going to let you do that mm -hmm. um, when you have a minute after the show. But it's very, very interesting how that information that you're looking at gets sent up to that occipital lobe, and then what, it, the, what we see and what we perceive as we're looking at it. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, but it looks like our entire brain is complete. So all of these lobes are working together to um, kind of perceive and understand the information that we're giving to it every day. And as we were saying before, it is super, super organized, so they know exactly what each lobe is responsible for. So when they get that little bit of information, there's no question of what needs to happen with it. They know exactly where to send it so that we can get the response as quick as possible, which is so, so important so that we're not just having little breaks throughout our day. Now, I have a very important question for my scientists. Is that what my brain looks like? Is it blue and orange and green and purple? <laughs> no, it is <laughs> not those colors, but this just helps um, show all of the different lobes of the brain. It would be really cool if it was those co colors, though. Now, we have one more question here from Hannah. Hello, Hannah. Uh, they are wondering, what's the black and white part of that graphic? Is it an extra special lobe? If we want to bring that graphic back up of our very special brain there. Now, Kenzie, do you know what that part is at the very bottom? Yes, I do. So that bottom part, that's actually called our cerebellum. And our cerebellum has lots of, um, it receives information from our different um, sensory organs and things like that. And it plays a huge part in our voluntary movements. Um, so it helps us get that information and then react to it. So that's called our cerebellum, and it is also a very important part um, of these cause and effect reactions as well. So thanks for the question. That's a great, great point that we want to make sure all of our viewers understand. Now it is time for my favorite part of the show. Mackenzie, Mia, are you ready for Science Showdown? Yeah. All right, so what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to provide them a function and they have to tell me which part of the brain is controlling that function. Okay. Oh. Should we do a little rundown first? A rundown? Like a practice one? Like what each one is. Okay, yes, let's review. Um, let's Mia, review. can you please review with us those parts? Yeah, so the frontal one has to do with planning. Um, it has to do with our regulating our emotions and stuff like that. Our parietal one has to do with temperature, um, pressure, touch, um, and stuff like that. Our uh, temporal one has to do with our hearing, which makes sense because it's right below our ears. Um, and then our occipital one has to do with our vision. All right. I think I've got it. I think I'm ready for this showdown. Yeah. Feeling very confident. All right. You have like five seconds to answer, okay? We're going to be real quick. Okay. Which lobe is responsible for vision? Four, five, time's up. Let's see your boards. Occipital. Occipital. Okay, now, uh, yeah. bonus point. Can you point to your Play-Doh yeah. brand there? Oh, perfect. Oh. Wow, <laughs> okay. Me and me are both on the same page. We're both occipital masters. We are so good at it. We oh know yeah. everything about it. All right, next question. Okay. I'll give you a quick second in a race. I'm getting a little nervous because the know. occipital one was the most. That uh, one was pretty easy. Yeah, that yeah. was the one I knew the best. So. All okay. right, ready? Yeah. Memory. Memory. Hmm. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see your boards. Oh, memory? I did not that wrong. Oh, memory uh, is temporal. Uh, yeah. Point for Mackenzie. Now, can you point to the temporal lobe? Temporal. Um, yeah, bottom, green. Yes, perfect. Yep, got it. All right, perfect. that's a point ready for, for the me. next one? Yep, I'm very ready. Okay. Pressure. Pressure. Oh, pressure, pressure, pressure. When you touch something and you oh, can feel right, the yes, pressure. I remember Maybe this. you're giving a hug and it's a really tight hug and you feel that pressure. Ready? Three, two, one, shoreboards. 
parietal. That is correct. Good job. Okay, next one. Race your boards. Kay. This one. Planning. Planning. Ooh. Five, Planning. four, three, two, oh. one. Oh no, I'm late. <laughs> let's see. Frontal. That is right. Good. Let's good. See on, let's see on our model brains. I think that's the blue, blue part. one. The blue. All right. Great. Hmm. What's a good? Tie? Are we? Are we at a tie? No, I think Mackenzie is one I point. I think I, I think I'm pulling you ahead here. Yeah, you have yeah. one point. Okay, okay, this one we'll do a, a special special question. Okay, this might be a little bit tricky. Okay, oh. double, no. the double the points. Double the points. Double the points. <laughs> double or nothing. Win it all. I okay? mean, I mean, Mia, you could catch up to me here, so I better okay. be on my best. Okay. Hoping my brain's ready for this. This part of your brain is responsible for balance and coordination. Oh goodness. Five, four. Three, two, one. Let's see. I'm not confident. Cerebellum? <laughs> that is right, Mackenzie. That oh, is your what? cerebellum. I, I, I took a wild guess on that because I don't remember talking about that when we did our diagram. So I'm glad that I uh, can make a good mm -hmm. hypothesis because my hypothesis turned out to be correct this time. I was thinking hearing, and that has to do with balance. That's why oh I said the temporal right. one. That's a, that's a very good guess, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very good. <laughs> very good educated guess. Now, we have another question here. What color is our brain? Mia, do you know what color our brain is? Our brain color is gray with hints of white, black, and red. So it's not bright orange and blue and green and purple? It is not. Oh. Yeah, something really cool is um, last summer at ICE camp, actually, we got to go to the psychology lab. And in the psychology lab, they actually have a real brain. Now, it's preserved and it's like in this jar. We're not allowed to touch it or anything like that, but you could observe it. So you could see all of these different folds and you could see the color. And I can confirm that it was pretty gray looking. So that is a true fact. Mia is definitely... Um, a master. She knows everything there is about the brain. I can tell. Now, scientists, we have another question here. How many nerves are in our body? Do, you, do either of you know? I do, yes. There is so, so many nerves. And, I mean, we don't have an exact number. Everyone might have a little bit different. But scientists say there's around 7 trillion nerves in our entire body, which is so, so many. Like That's a lot of zeros. That is so many zeros. I would not want to have to write that number out. Wow. All right. Uh, that wraps up our science showdown. Congratulations, Mackenzie. Uh, now, uh, let's take a look at our STEM spotlight for this week. It is Dr. Lisa Peeling, a neurosurgeon. On today's STEM Spotlight, we want you to meet Dr. Lisa Peeling. She's a neurosurgeon in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. She performs surgery on patients who have challenges with their nervous system, and this includes brains, spinal cords, and nerves. For example, neurosurgeons may operate on someone who has a brain tumor or who suffers from brain trauma. They may also operate on someone who has had a spinal cord injury. What incredible work, Dr. Peeling. An amazing woman and neurosurgeon and I don't think I could have the guts to operate on someone's brain, but I'm glad that there are people out there who do. Now it is time for our segment, Ask Our Scientist. All right, so the first question we have here are, what are reflexes? Scientists, do we know? Yes, of course. So reflexes, or like a reflex action, it's something that happens um, involuntarily or almost um, like instantaneously. So it's something that happens where we don't even really wait for a response. It just happens so quick that we don't even think about it. So um, for example, there is different reflexes in our body that if you um, like hit them or tap them, it might like just create a movement right away. So for example, there is a reflex right here on our knee. So sometimes um, if you're at the doctor's office, they might like lightly tap your, your knee. And if it hits the reflex, it'll go like whoop, whoop and kind of like kick out and that's a reflex, it's an involuntary action. It just happens right away, it happens so quickly and we don't really even need to think about it. So it kind of like skips part of the pathway, it just happens super, super quick um, and some would say like instantaneously. So it's just in an instant. And Mackenzie, did you know that we actually have some reflexes when we're a baby and then they go away as we get older? Yes, there's quite a few reflexes um, when we're 
a baby. So they're somewhere you can like touch their cheek. And if they're trying to find it, that means that they're hungry. Or there's some there where if you try to, um, if you're holding the baby and you just lightly um, drop them, it, they'll flail out. So they're trying to um, like kind of expand and so that they're like in a falling motion so that they can fall safely. So we're actually born with a lot of these different reflexes and they're just little different adapted traits that we've had that help with um, kind of understanding the stimuli and things that are happening around us. Yeah. Now, another question here is, what is a brain tumor? Mia, do you know what a brain tumor is? Yes. So a brain tumor is a mass or growth um, on your cells in your brain. So they're not supposed to be there. And then it makes this um, large thing, which becomes a tumor. And brain tumors can... Um, uh, affect you greatly. For example, you could have al hallucinations from them. Um, there's also lots of different types of brain tumors. So some are benign, which means that they're not cancerous. And then there are some that are cancerous, um, which could be very life-threatening. Mm -hmm. And I remember benign is good and malignant is bad because benign is kind of like behave. Like I like to think of it that even though there is mass there, it's not harmful. It's behaving per se. Now we have another question from the Hayes brothers. I heard when we look at the sun, the brain senses that there, there is too much light. And with that, that makes us sneeze. Is this true? Mackenzie, is this true? Well, Hayes brothers, you kind of stumped me on this one, but luckily we have this crazy little pathway that um, sends messages to our headquarters and back, kind of like our you know, our nervous system. So we sent this question to headquarters really quick and they actually just sent me back the answer. So I'm just going to read the answer for you here. And it says the photic sneeze reflex is a reflex condition that causes sneezing in response to numerous stimuli, such as looking at bright lights. So I think what you're referring to is actually a reflex. So it's really cool that we have these different um, reactions and responses in our body that just happen just like that. So that's a response to numerous stimuli um, called the fontic sneeze reflex. All right, folks, that wraps up today's episode of Couch Potato Lab. Thank you for joining us here today, and we'll hope to see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.